Welcome to episode six of For the Purpose of, the podcast about trends, big ideas, and exciting news in the world of EdTech, helping you consider the purpose behind your next EdTech integration. I'm Keith Tramper, and I'm joined by my colleagues, Ron Hall and Sarah Wood. So to give you a little sneak peek into our agenda for today, we're going to be talking about some of the biggest takeaways from a call a couple of weeks ago in Grand Rapids. We have our returning segment of So Ron, a little resource roundup from the interwebs, and some updates on professional learning for you. Before you get too far, what's McCall stand for? Michigan Association of Computer Users and Learning. Okay. Yes. Is that right? You won the prize. Yes. You oh. got a prize today. <laughs> I hope I know it. <laughs> All right. Okay, so to kick us off, let's do a little uh, little warm-up question here that might be a little revealing. Um, what is the first music album you owned? Okay, so my first album was Kraftwerk, K-R-A-F-T-W-E-R-K. The album title was Autobahn. And if you've never heard of Kraftwerk before, I am absolutely sure you've heard their work before because they are a lot of times the backing track for so much classic, um, so many different tunes from hip hop. You'd just be amazed how many times you'll hear this track. If I played it for you, you'd be like, that's where that came from. So um, they are a German electronic, electronica band. They're kind of like the originator of most of the German, well, actually most electronic music and techno and stuff like that. So it's from 1974, 75, believe it or not. Nice. Yep. Hey, Keith, what's yours? Uh, We were talking about this last night, my wife and I. um, I'm taking her on my, so I went through, I'm I'm telling you guys this, I don't think you know this about me. Um, I have a little bit of punk rock blood in me um, from my, my earlier years. So I'm taking my wife through a uh, a journey of punk rock because it's like the one thing she hates the most in the world. So um, my first album was Dookie by Green Day, um, which, you know, has so many amazing hits, but was kind of credited as one of those uh, first albums that really brought punk rock into the mainstream. So um, that was a good one. Sarah, what was yours? Well, I have to say props on the uh, Green Day. That was probably in my top five of my first purchases. Um, it's it's embarrassing because I probably only listened to this for like three months and I was like, why did I buy that? But my first one was The Breeders, their last Splash album, because I was all about that song Cannonball. Would not listen to it today, really. That's not my jam. <laughs> nice. Yeah, but... I appreciate you taking your wife on that journey of something that really annoys her. Cause my husband <laughs> did that to me with Jimmy Buffett. I can't stand Jimmy Buffett Oh, and he loves it. Is so. your husband a parrot head? Isn't yes. that what they call themselves? Yes. yes. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Well, you know, it's one of the things that you find out about music that you, you know, you got into when you were young though, is most of the time your music, music taste does not change a whole lot from, those formative years too, when you're around, you know, somewhere between 10 and 15 years old, that's what you end up liking for the rest of your life. So I know with me, with that electronica album, that's like one of my favorite genres is electronica. Um, but I do like the ones that you both mentioned too. So I think you have preferences, right? But then you start to kind of widen those things. Maybe as I get a little more seasoned as a, an adult living on this planet, I might end up going into who knows what later. As long as it's, you know, not that kind of music you listen to or it's putting you to sleep. All right. On to our big topic. Obviously, a couple weeks ago, as we're recording this now, uh, just before spring break, um, we are, you know, just a few weeks out from McCall Conference um, in Grand Rapids. And I thought we could take a few minutes and just kind of talk about what were the biggest takeaways. Um, All three of us went this year and I'm going to turn it over to Ron, first, and tell us what were your biggest takeaways. Yep. So I usually refer to this as LobbyCon, you know, like the best part of the conference is getting to see new people that you haven't, or new people, see people, I guess they are new to me now after two years, um, of seeing people and talking to them and catching up with folks. I think that's usually the strength of most of the conferences that I've gone to, you know, pre-pandemic and post-pandemic. 
um, is just meeting with people and talking to them, catching up and seeing how they're doing. Um, I went to quite a few sessions uh, at the conference also. And to be honest, I didn't find a lot of new stuff. Um, I found a lot of things that maybe I've learned over the last several years um, online. I did find, I, I think the biggest thing, which I really like about conferences, not just McCall, but many other conferences I've been to do this, are poster sessions. And the poster sessions that they'll have set up in different places are usually the best place where you can take some time, be a little introspective and actually talk to somebody versus the conference presentation where somebody tries to fit in two hours worth of content into 50 minutes. Um, those things just seem to be a, a lot better way that you can connect with people, ask lots of questions that you might not be able to ask in a regular conference session. So between the lobby con side and poster session, I think those are the biggest uh, things that I see from going to any conference. So, and Sarah, what's yours? Um, this year was a little unique for me just due to some, um, different roles that I had at the conference and the fact that I was doing, uh, social media for McCall during that time. So I felt like I could never really jump into one session and like pull things away. But on the flip side of that, I got to see a little bit of everything, which was super nice. Um, I have to say probably my favorite part was simply like you mentioned, Ron, seeing people either for the first time, like I've had all sorts of virtual meetings with them, but never actually seen them in person um, or seeing people I haven't seen in a long time. So that was great. But what was um, a big takeaway for me was play date. I was able to hang out in there for a little bit, get some pictures and video. And I was like angry that I couldn't stay and play because I wanted to do all the things like that's my hands on jam kind of thing. Um, but also another thing that I noticed, which goes back to a previous conversation that the three of us have had, someone was sharing voice thread. And that was kind of one of our uh, blasts from the past ones. So maybe it's making a comeback. Um, so that was interesting. But I'm not going to lie. The most important part was Ron receiving the president's award. Props to him. Props to him. Yeah, that I was brought there under false pretenses for that. Thank you for that. that was, <laughs> Absolutely, any time. <laughs> that was that's an honor. I'm I'm glad to have received that. It, it was kind of I'm still a little like verklempt, I think is the word that you used to <laughs> have to know that word. Such a thing. It's like uh, you know, like that. Oh. Yeah. Best described mm -hmm. with the sound. That's yeah. my kind of definition. <laughs> me? Really? For me? Yeah. No, because it was simply the look on your face. Like you were completely surprised. And I'm like, I don't know if I've ever seen Ron completely surprised or taken aback by something. So that was like, it was meaningful for me. <laughs> so they did a really good job of hiding any announcement of that on the internet. Because I, I use a Google Alerts and I've got a Google Alert that has my name in it. And I would suggest every teacher in the world do this, by the way, too, is if you, I would put your name in Google alerts and get a, an email sent to you when your name pops up any place for anything new that it finds. Because it's a really good um, resource, too, in case you've got, I don't know, people like kids that like to post things sometimes. It's really great to know that. But they didn't even do that, so I couldn't even know. So, All right. Keith, what was your big thing? Yeah, um, I had a kind of a weird experience this year because I got sick for the first two days of McCall, um, was feeling better by Friday. So I kind of missed out on a lot. I had some serious FOMO watching the Twitters um, on Wednesday and Thursday of the conference. Um, but I did make it on Friday, was feeling much better at that point and uh, made it for my presentation, which was good. But I think the thing that I walked away with the most was it just it feels so good to be around people that are kind of part of your tribe. Um, and just to like both of you said, just to reconnect with people that you haven't seen in a while, especially after two years um, and meet some of those people that you have been doing work with, but have never actually met <laughs> um, face to face. So it's just good for your soul. I feel like as far as topic goes, um, I've seen, I feel like I saw a shift away from a lot of like the tools and the how to stuff. There was still some of that, um, but there, it seemed like there was more focus around like bigger topics of how tech touches into um, like SEL or equity or um, engagement, personalization, STEM, 
leadership, like all these different aspects of the jobs that we do and the, in the expectations that are put on teachers. Um, and then looking at those through a lens of what technology can do to make it more effective or, um, more powerful in some cases. So, and just, you know, on top of all that, I, I think it was reinforced. I didn't, I wasn't there the day that Ron got his, his president's award. That would, that would have been so cool to be able to see that live. I did see it all over the Twitters, Ron. I think a lot of people, uh, uh, you know, felt that you were very well deserving of that award. So, um, myself included. So it's really great to see, um, you recognize for the work that you've added into the ed tech community and to McCall, um, over the years that you've been in this role. So been very cool. Uh, and also, you know, the day after, uh, McCall, we found out Sarah got an award too. So she's being very humble. I'm bringing it up here. She just gave me a stink face. Um, so Sarah got an award too, through, um, the Kalamazoo air zoo for just recognizing her for her work in STEM as well when she was um, at her former district. so And she's going to, they call it the Hall of Fame even. Ooh. Now I regret bringing up Ron. <laughs> <laughs> See, that's the thing about being introverted a little bit. You know, it's like we never want to be on the stage. We're just yeah. happy that it helps other people. And other than that, it's like, okay, uh, time for the, okay, bye. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to slide off to the side here. <laughs> Yep. But uh, I, I just, you know, walking away from uh, that weekend was uh, just thinking to myself, man, I have some really great colleagues and I'm very uh, blessed to work with you guys. So, Well, can I add that also Keith was the first person to ever receive the golden keyboard at Kent ISD. So let's bring it full circle and make sure you get recognition <laughs> for your work as well. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Sarah. Yep. Anytime. Anytime. We'll be right back after this quick commercial break. Did you know that you can earn free state continuing education contact hours, also known as sketches, through the Remsey Association's Professional Learning Services? That's right, the Remsey provides educators with free instructor led courses and events with the opportunity to earn free sketches. Check out all the current and future opportunities at remsey.org and look for the professional learning link. Well, now that we're back here, I've been thinking. We haven't yet hit one of my favorite segments of our podcast and that all right, where we, you know, pose Ron with a question. And the great way to start that off is with, so Ron, what do you think about the kind of the general idea of nudging in the professional aspect? Yep. So thank you. <laughs> one of the things that we mentioned in the Ed Connect newsletter that we send out, and if you're not subscribed, you'll have some information about that near the end of this podcast, is there's a book that I recently reread. It's called Nudge. It's by Richard Thaler and Cass Sunstein. Um, they talk about, they call it choice architecture. Uh, choice architecture in big picture just says that uh, when we build systems for people or we build experiences for people, we want to make sure that there's no question about what they should be doing, where they should be going. Um, there, it's a lot deeper than that, but it really brought me back to a couple of experiences that I've had as of late in thinking about schools and how we do instruction in schools. Um, so unfortunately, I had to um, end up spending some time in a couple of um, hospital situations in the last month or so. And one thing I noticed when you've got a lot of time to hang around and just stare at walls, that you'll notice that because hospitals have to be extremely efficient organizations with a huge turnover in staff, so you might not always have the same people on the same floor or the same group of folks working together, you have to have systems that work really well together and you have to have systems that are well-defined. And the thing that really struck me, you know, as I was, I had plenty of time to stare at things um, in hospitals, if you've been on any floors or through an emergency department, you will notice if you <laughs> are not doing something else that they label everything. And in particular, the hospitals that I was in, there's always, you know, some amount of equipment that you might have that needs to be in a specific place. So there's absolutely no question when minutes count that you know where it is 
and you can grab it and bring it to the place that you need to put it in. So I, I keep thinking that about schools is, you know, in, in the hospitals, they put pictures on the walls, like where this particular piece of equipment needs to be all the time, unless it's being used. And when it's done being used, it goes back in that spot. In our schools, a lot of times when we think about our educate or our educational materials, um, as I read through different curricular items, especially for kids that are learning remotely or even face to face, the how and what of instruction sometimes is a little bit nebulous. So a lot of times kids will end up asking so many procedural questions of teachers like, what do I do? What do I do next? When I'm done with this, what do I do? So that's one of the things I think about as we're developing in um, creating our instructional materials is to be extremely verbose and to use some keywords that I talk about when we're thinking about universal design for learning or just good instructional design is I want to make sure that kids don't ever hit a roadblock. And those roadblocks are many times introduced just by our descriptions of doing things. Um, so instead of read the book report or do the book report, <laughs> give some more detail about it. First, read the book, read chapter one and two, then summarize what you've read in the first you know, 20 pages. Next, work with a colleague inside of your classroom, compare your notes, then develop your uh, report. You know, whatever those words are, I, li I always like first, next, and then, and finally. Those are really great words to use with kids. But um, I think we as educators need to be extremely intentional about setting out those learning experiences for our kids and, and helping them. Because if the last two years haven't taught us um, anything at all, uh, the one thing it has taught us is that we need to, we need to remove roadblocks and help our kids make it from one place to another. And if we aren't doing that, it ends up creating a lot more work in our teaching profession that we have to re-explain things. But if we did that at the very beginning, we would have a lot more time for quality um, assistance to our students instead of just being a re-explainer all the time. So again, nudge choice architecture, like really developing things so somebody can take a pathway all the way through our instruction. They know where to go, just like the emergency department. You know where everything is. There's no question about it. Um, same thing with our instruction. Make sure that we've got multiple ways to tell kids how to do stuff, but make sure those instructions are written out well. And I, I wish that we, I don't know, even in teacher school, I guess I could ask um, <laughs> Keith or Sarah, I don't recall this in my teacher training really about how to write great instructions. It wasn't really a thing. Did you guys get that at all? Not at all. <laughs> no, I feel like I learned about 50% of what I needed in teacher school and figured the rest out on like experience. <laughs> yeah. And I, I think that's a thing about um, good instructional design, especially when we're hybrid or online, uh, not, I, I don't think anybody ever took a college course on how to teach in a pandemic. I don't think that was a thing. So we all had to kind of do it. This is a great time. I think now that we're coming to hopefully the end of all this, that we can really take some stock in and, and reconsider how that we present this stuff, both face-to-face -face and a hybrid situation for our students. So there's it. There's your rant of the day or week or month, maybe. Well, I appreciate you sharing that. And it's interesting that you say that you like using words because I feel like when I'm reading directions and I'm hearing first do this, second do this, or, you know, whatever, like I can't make sense of the words, like give me a numbered list, give me a bulleted list. Like I visually need to see that. So it's just interesting how everyone's um, way of taking in that information is a little bit different. I agree. And, you know, thank, thank God for great colleagues. Um, Sarah, you mentioned like you learned a lot of this through, um, you know, experience with, with your own students. And I, I very much the same way, but I, I know I learned from a lot of great colleagues um, who, you know, it, it was like, you could walk into their room, the teachers who have been doing it for a while, and they've got like images and procedures and pl things that you can see anywhere that really help guide students. So, um, I know as a former secondary teacher, like <laughs> it's that it's the age old, like, okay, any questions on how you do that? Okay. You heard all the directions, ready to go. And then like a thousand questions come up and it's like, I, we just went through that. <laughs> so like, you know, it kind of begs the question, how do you design for a better interaction and alleviate so many of those questions and anxiety from your students? 
Another thing that, that leads to a lot of times is, um, you know, giving kids such an overload of what they need to do at the very beginning. They, they're just sitting there processing all the words you just said, all the word salad. Um, it, word salad. It, if, you go, <laughs> if you give them so much information to process right at the beginning, too, it's like, I was trying to figure out what you wanted the first thing to be, and now you're on the fifth thing. That's why I'm going to ask you lots of questions. I don't even know how you got to number five. Yeah, <laughs> for okay. sure. Well, it's it's the same thing as you know, like listening to. I don't know about you guys, but sometimes when I read a book after I'm done with a chapter, I'm like, what? I don't remember anything I just read. So, <laughs> absolutely. Or, you know, or listening to a podcast like this one, and, and it starts going off the rails. Like, where did the last five <laughs> minutes go? I don't know. Not with this, never. Yeah. All right. Okay, so next thing we're going to talk about is called Around the Interwebs. This is our collection of things that we found lately or interesting. Uh, the links that we're going to mention here will be found in our newsletter. Again, at the end of this uh, podcast, we'll give you a nice link where you can go to and subscribe. And if, if you are not subscribed, we would love to have you do that. And if you are subscribed, you should check it out as soon as you get it. Um, this month, one of the ones I found, I was kind of interested in this because Google does a ton of professional learning development around their products that they have. So one of the new ones that I found is it's called Google Cloud Skills Boost. Lots of words there. Um, so this is part of their Google Cloud certification program. It's absolutely free. And they have a Google Workspace for Education um, badge and a quest that you can go through on productivity and collaboration. So this Google Workspace for Education productivity quest goes through um, understanding Google Workspace for Education. It's about 40 minutes long. Um, managing different services that you might have inside of a, if you're an administrator, you can do some of that stuff. Setting up your Google Meet for Distance Learning, managing Google Classroom, teaching with Classroom. Um, that's got a challenge lab at the end of it. So these badges that you get, um, you can post them to different places, maybe your LinkedIn profile or something like that. But I found it was really nice. Um, it's worth about, it's like seven hours worth of stuff. Um, but they've got quite a few of these things in their Google Cloud Skills Boost, where if you want to learn more about any of the Google stuff um, that you may or may not know, it's a great place to get some of that information. So besides that, um, that's my my one and only just because it's so big. And if you would like to learn more, that's where you can go. Sarah, what'd you find? Well, you had me at Quest on that. That kind of made me think, you know, Legend of Zelda and quests and things like that. So that brought me another little flashback other than the music that we mentioned at the beginning, which just dates me a little bit. But on that note, let's talk about something more modern. Um, one of the things that I shared this um, newsletter is about custom Wordle puzzles. I am not a Wordler myself. I've done a couple, but I am not an everyday um, in posting my results and everything. But I did share some ways that you can make your own custom Wordle puzzles that you could use with students in your classroom. And this is not just words. I also shared one. So if you're one of those math teachers, those awesome math teachers, there's actually one called Nerdle, which is one all about, and yeah, I know it hits Keith and I deep on that with that math, but um, allows you to have students problem solve using that Wordle process, but only with mathematical equations. So I'm on board for those custom ones. They're fun. Um, Keith, what, what do you want to share this month? Yeah. So coming off of McCall, um, I know if you're like me, I, you might go into a session and you're looking at someone's slides and you're like, wow, those are incredible. How did they manage that? Um, I know when Sarah in particular puts things together on slides, I'm always like, man, she's got like that, that just eye for design. It's so cool. Um, so I'm always jealous of that. And I'm always looking for ways to like, um, amp up my Google Slides game. And so I thought uh, in the newsletter this time around, I would share some of the things that I use to make my stuff look nice. Um, so the first two are just sites that are, are that host a whole bunch of different uh, templates for Google Slides. Um, the first is Slides Mania, and the second is Slides Carnival. Just a ton of stuff there that you can, um, you know, either sometimes I use it as just a place to start from. Um, other times it's nice to just grab and go um, and start with a really nice looking presentation. 
I also use coolers, coolers, color. I don't know how you say it. It's cool. O R S. Uh, and it's a place that lets you, um, generate color palettes. So you can kind of do them randomly or look at the different colors that are trending, um, based on the season or the day or whatever's going on. It is a fantastic site for generating color schemes that look really nice together. And the bonus of that is they have a contrast checker as well. So you can tell if you're going to be that person that puts all, all your stuff up on slides and then you can't read the text at all because the colors don't contrast enough. Um, you can just kind of check it with their contrast checker. And then lastly, the, the two places I go to a lot, um, if I'm looking for photos, um, Unsplash is a fantastic place to go and grab really high quality photos um, that have licenses that let you use them um, as long as you remember to cite them. And uh, the second place I go a lot, um, almost every presentation I make, I feel like I'm using Flat Icon. Um, they are a site that has just tons and tons of icons on it that you can just drop into your, your uh, presentations. Um, I particularly, I, I pretty much stick exclusively with FreePick, which is one of the authors. I believe they are the people that kind of produce Flat Icon as well. Um, but they, uh, their license is um, essentially like it's free as long as you cite where you got it from. So great stuff. Um, good places to go to boost up your Google Slides game. And on that note, I'm going to turn it over to Sarah to talk a little bit about upcoming opportunities. Yes. And I would just like to say thank you for the compliment. But most of my design stuff comes from Slides Mania or Slides Carnival or even Slides Go is another favorite one, too. So and I also... Another one that I use as far as images is the Noun Project for simple black and white ones. That's another one of my go-tos. So if you want to learn more about that, actually, I suggest that you sign up for the Virtual Make and Take series. We have two more left for this uh, academic year. We'll end at the end of May this month, which was just released. Um, we will be delving into Hyperdex and our final one, which is tech tech which will be all about making videos instructional videos for your classroom so don't miss those and also because of the awesome response that we received from you guys is that we will be running a summer session on virtual make and takes where we'll be jumping into learning roadmaps animated gifts and classroom cribs and so those will all be things to get you set for your the beginning of your school year so feel free to sign up for that as well we also have a new kind of professional development that will be coming this summer. And I use professional development, but I probably should say professional learning. So if you are someone who's received like a Stitch Fix box or even like a Kiwi Crate kind of subscription box, we are flipping that to professional learning and we will be sending out basically subscription style boxes that will have professional learning in there. And that will be STEM based with a sprinkle of design thinking, but we will also be working with other Kent ISD consultants beyond Ron, Keith, and I. So you'll get to hear from Wendy Vogel, Mark Astasia, and Mark Raffler, as well as Eric Kelleher. Um, to hear more about that design thinking and how it fits with STEM and just a really fun learning experience. I'm really excited for that one. And finally, we have, we will be running our design thinking PDX newsletter, professional learning, and we've been piloting it this uh, spring here, I guess you can say winter spring and we will be bringing it back this summer it will be the same content that we've had there but we hope that everyone has a chance to take a break uh break and take a breath before they engage in that we want to respect that and give everyone that opportunity so we'll be rerunning that same course again this summer so look for that other upcoming opportunities for you this year and especially in April, because I guess that's still this year, our computer science panel on April 20th with Victoria Fleener from Cornerstone University. She is an associate or assistant professor of computer science at CU. She's going to talk about computer science and education, how it impacts the world around us. In addition, we've got our computer science workshop April 27 at Kent ISD. And that link that I keep mentioning that I said I'm going to say later is right here right now if you're ready for it. Um, all of our EdTech offerings, the ones that Sarah's mentioned, Keith and myself, 
are located at bit.ly, B-I-T dot L-Y slash I am edtech. And that's all smashed together, all lowercase. So bit.ly slash I-A-M-E-D-T-E-C-H. All right, that's it for this episode of For the Purpose Of. To get more information and links to the things we discussed in the podcast, check out our show notes. Do you have some big takeaways from McCall or want to share the first album you had with us? Uh, we'd love to hear from you. You can reach out by emailing us at edtech at kentisd.org or heading to bit.ly slash I am edtech. If you like the podcast, please take a minute to like and subscribe and share it with a friend. Catch you next time on For the Purpose Of. This podcast is a service of Kent ISD. It's produced by Ron Heltman, Sarah Wood, and Keith Tramper. Our theme music is Neon Nights by Scott Holmes Music, courtesy of freemusicarchive.org. Our ad music is Vienna Beat by Blue Dot Sessions. Why can't I say these words? Keith, help me. You got this, Rod. You, you can do it. <laughs> you can do it. You can do it. Okay, okay. We'll get to ride again.